الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Page 141, the general social boycott. The situation got bad, and Hamza and Umar becoming Muslim is the 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 last straw, so to speak. So now what they've said, Banu Abdul Shams and Banu Nawfal, they've said this is not our problem. This is Banu Hashim's problem. Muhammad is from Banu Hashim, and he's got nothing to do with us. So what they've said, and because Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib are close to each other, and Abdul Shams and Nawfal are close to each other, and these are the predominant tribes of Quraysh, they've got together, Abdul Shams and Nawfal, and they've said, we're going to cut off ties with Hashim and Muttalib. And we're going to write it down on a parchment and place it into the Qibla. The only exception is Abu Lahab himself, who was the uncle of the Prophet who was from Banu Hashim. This now includes no food, no water, no trade, no marriage, no talking. Complete boycott. Ibn Umar, when he was talking about this situation, he said that we were so starved and delirious, we would say whatever they wanted us to say. That's how bad the situation became. They went away in what is known as Shib, the Shib of uh, Abu Talib. He had what we called um, a hut, so to speak, a cabin, uh, slightly on the outskirts of, of, uh, of Makkah, because they were not really welcomed in Makkah. They were not allowed to stay in Makkah anymore. So they went on the outskirts of Makkah, and that's where people were smuggling food and drink to them. Those people who sympathized uh, to, for, for the Muslims and the boycott, etc. Until three years later, Zuhair ibn Abi Umayyah, Hisham ibn Amr, and Mut'am ibn Adin. The reason why I've underlined Mut'am here is because this is actually the second time in the seerah when his name comes about, because the first time is when they were putting a lot of pressure on Abu Talib, to the extent that they were getting quite aggressive with him, with their emotional blackmail, with Abu Talib, they were saying, either you have him or us, leave your protection, Salam. leave your protection or us. And Mut'im just said, listen, just calm down, he is one of us, he is not a Muslim, etc., so you're being angry with the wrong person. So he helped the Messenger of Allah inadvertently on that day, and on this day also. So these three gentlemen plotted against the boycott. So what they did is they went to parliament, let's say, a meeting, uh, and they conspired against Abu Jahl. And Abu Jahl knew that there was a conspiracy against him. And when they came out with that conspiracy, simultaneously the Messenger of Allah وسلم, tells Abu Talib that the parchment has been destroyed. Inside of the Kaaba, he can't see it because the parchment has been placed inside the Kaaba. The Prophet was praying outside of the Kaaba. He goes and tells his uncle Abu Talib, the parchment has been destroyed. The Quraysh become happy now. They said, okay, well, Zuhair and uh, Hisham and, um, uh, and Mut'im, even though we're not happy with stopping the boycott, we think the boycott is working well, but if you want this, Muhammad said he wants it as well, let's open the Kaaba doors and see whether the parchment is broken or not. How can the parchment all of a sudden vanish? It makes sense. The Prophet ﷺ spoke the truth. Allah inspired to the Messenger of Allah that the parchment has now been eaten up by insects, except for the name of Allah. Ibn Kathir said the opposite, except for the dhulm that was there, to highlight to them the oppression that they were doing. Others from the, the people of Sira have said everything was taken away, except for the name of Allah. Uh, but what, either case, they now had uh, the, the revelation of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, confirmed to them. Their response was, he's a magician. And this is just magic. It was here now, and I don't think this is mentioned in the book, it was here now with some of the people of Sira, is that they asked for another side to see whether he was speaking the truth. And he pointed at the moon, and the moon then split into two halves. And again, they said, this is magic. He's doing magic again. So when people came in to Mecca, they attested that they saw the moon on one side. and It wasn't an illusion. Now, what we can learn from this is that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is being told that he will overcome the Quraysh. That's what a sign that we can learn with the moon splitting. But we can also learn with the parchment being destroyed is that Tawheed will return to and inside the Kaaba. And like we've said, with difficulty, there is always a miracle. There is always a glad tidings given to the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, skipping a few pages, let's go to the year of grief, which is the 10th year of prophethood, whilst he is still in, uh, in Mecca, and what the ulama have coined together, the term, the year of grief. 
some of the ulama, like we discussed when we were explaining it, in Sheikh al-Bani, Imam Suyuti, they've said that there is no such thing as the year of sadness, because the Prophet ﷺ was a sabir, and he wasn't afflicted by grief. Whatever the case, majority of the people of Sirah have called this the year of sadness. Abu Talib is getting old, and the Quraysh are putting a lot of pressure on him, and they couldn't break him down, and the Prophet ﷺ couldn't break him down either. The Prophet is inviting him to Tawheed, Tawheed. He's not listening. The Quraysh are inviting him to leave protection. He's not listening. Abu Talib is stuck in this middle. And what we can learn from this is that Allah is the one who guides and the Prophet ﷺ has no share in Rububiyyah and this is what is revealed in Surah Qasas. But what we can learn as a direct refutation against those people who worship the Messenger of Allah make gulu and excessiveness to the Messenger of Allah. After Abu Talib passes away, he doesn't make istighatha of himself. He doesn't say, Ya Muhammad, Ishfili, or Ya Muhammad, I'm feeling bad. But he doesn't make istighath of himself. So how is it possible that people can make istighath? Where istighath is to make du'a to the deceased to help them to remove something which is difficult for them in their lives after the going of the Prophet ﷺ. Also what we learn in the, in the, the connection that the Prophet ﷺ had with Abu Talib is there is a common concept which is known as al-wala and al-bara which is loving and hating for the sake of Allah. And this is often misunderstood and misapplied by extremists. In this we learn, the Prophet ﷺ was very sad and he had a natural love for a kafir, who was Abu Talib, his own uncle. So not all the kuffar are the same, that's one thing. But also what we learn is, with the relationship with the Messenger of Allah and Abu Talib, is that there is a difference between these two terminologies, which is a tawalli and mu'alat. And I don't want to get too technical, but this is very important to this, uh, to this whole discussion of how Muslims should uh, live with non-Muslims, etc., and... And we have a direct context of the Prophet ﷺ in dealing with the kuffar. Is that a tawalli is general support and that is permissible. You can have general support from the kuffar and that is permissible. What extremists are saying today, and this is what even people are being told that this is what Islam is when it is not, is that Islam doesn't have any relationship with the kuffar and any kind of relationship would be a hostile one. Islam is telling us here you can do tawalli. You can have a relationship, you can have natural love, you can have a dunyawi sense of support for one another. But mu'alat is kufr. And mu'alat is when a person loves the kufar for their kufr, and he supports them in their kufr. Or he supports them against Islam. Now, can we be extreme in that scenario? Again, we can't be extreme in that scenario, but that's one of those things that we can't compromise. That's a, a line where we don't cross. But the Prophet ﷺ, how did he approach that line? He did it with hikmah. He did it with sabr. He did it with gentleness. He didn't say... We just, we just had the discussion where he had with Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. He was talking to him and he's talking to him with his kunya and he's saying my uncle and he's speaking to him nicely. He's reciting the Qur'an to him. He's telling him, listen, I can't do mu'alat. I'm sorry, I can't do it. And he's speaking to him and he's having a dialogue with him. He's not being insulting. He's not accusing. He's not defaming. He's not labeling. He's not doing all of those things that how often Muslims react to when it comes to shirk, when it comes to foreign affairs, when it comes to things like SRE, you know, they become very um, undiplomatic and they don't use hikmah. The Prophet ﷺ always used hikmah. Abu Talib passes away, three days later, now if you can compare, Hamza becomes Muslim, three days later, Umar becomes Muslim. Like we've said, there's always some kind of parallel between the Prophet ﷺ going through sabr and then shukr. Difficulty and then relief. Here we have another example of that. Hamza becomes Muslim. Three days later, Umar becomes Muslim. Abu Talib passes away. Three days later, his beloved wife passes away. Now his whole world, if you want to talk about metaphors, has come crashing down. His authority, his political support, his uncle and his emotional support and his wife have passed away. On top of that, like we just said before, and this is why I made that point earlier, many converts have already left Makkah. So not only has his emotional support, not only has his uh, actual uh, governmental support, if you want to call it that, but even his friends, and now he's left in Makkah alone. Now the Quraysh are very happy, because the protection has been dropped. They can do whatever they want to Muhammad. And as we will see, after he comes back from Ta'if, they have a plot. This is it. He's got no protection left. The Prophet ﷺ realizes, and some of the ulama said that this is six months after the death of Khajiji, some of them said it was sooner. Whatever the case, not long after, he goes to Ta'if. Now the reason why he goes to Ta'if is that he 
literally is turning and metaphorically is turning his back to Mecca. He is now going somewhere else for protection. He is saying to the people of Mecca, "You are not protecting me. I'm going with somewhere else." He goes with Zayd bin Haritha. Aisha radiallahu anha said about Zayd, "Had he been alive and the Messenger of Allah passed away, he would have definitely been the next Caliph." This is the level of this man. At this stage in the seerah, he was actually known as Zayd ibn Muhammad, the adopted son of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He takes him, and they go out to Taif, and they are ridiculed. They have sarcastic remarks being made about them. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ stays there for a period of nearly two weeks until one of the foolish amongst them says, why don't we just beat them up? Why don't we stone them? Why don't we hit them with our baseball bats? Why don't... And they were beaten so badly, they were bleeding. And there's another narration, which I believe is in uh, uh, another book of Sira. I can't remember exactly, so I'm not going to quote it. The Prophet ﷺ almost lost consciousness. He didn't know where he was. He almost lost consciousness. Until when he got to a place, and this is when Jibreel comes down to him. He says, Jibreel, I have come down with me. Uh, I have come down and with me is the mountain, the, the angel of the mountains. If you want, Ya Rasulullah, we can get Ta'if crushed between these mountains. Now, is that far-fetched? No, it's not far-fetched because the Prophet had divine support. He had the unseen with him. And prophets and messengers before made dua and Allah helped them. Nuh is a perfect example. Salih, Lut, all of these anbiya, they made dua and Allah gave them relief just like that. And they crushed the nation that rejected them and were violent towards them. The Prophet knew that the dua would be accepted. However, he is Rahmatullah He is the best of mankind. He is the leader of all the prophets and the messengers. He was much more optimistic. And he said, I don't want that for them. Because from their progeny, I am sure that there will be people who come out who say, La ilaha illallah. And what we can learn from this, and like I've said, we'll try as much as we can to stop and take a benefit before we move on from every kind of major event. What we learn from this is that the Prophet was not sent to kill. He was not sent to chastise and blame. That's the easy way out. All he has to do is lift his hands and that's it. It's finished. It would have been easier for him to kill. It's harder for him to have sabr and have ubudiyah and call towards worshipping Allah alone. And that's what he chose for his people. He's just been beaten. He delirious. He was unconscious almost. He had that chance. He could have just acted out of emotion. But he didn't. He then directed his emotions towards Allah and he made a very long and heartwarming dua to Allah where he is complaining about himself. He's saying, Oh Allah, as long as you're not angered with me, I am not, I don't care what's happened. And I only complain to you about my weakness with the people. They have rejected me in Makkah now, they're rejecting me in Ta'if only because of my own weakness. And he continues in his dua and he continues in his night prayer and then they enter back into Mecca and they are hiding in Hira. They can't go back to Mecca. There is no protection. So as people are passing by Hira, the Prophet ﷺ is there with Zaid. As people are passing by, they are calling people over and trying to speak to them. They see Al-Akhnas, they see other people and they say, listen, I'm sorry, I can't. Until they see Mut'im ibn Adi. Again, his name is underlined. This is the third time he helps the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And he agrees to give him protection. So Mut'im takes the Prophet ﷺ, takes him to the Kaaba, and he announces the protection under his authority now to the whole of the Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ prays two rakat at the Kaaba, and Mut'im assures 24-7 protection for the Messenger of Allah to the extent that he himself used to guard the house of the Messenger of Allah, and he used to take tons, turns with his sons. Now, Abu, Abu Talib has passed away, Khadija has passed away, and he has been rejected at Ta'if. What happens now, around about now, he marries Aisha, replacement. Abu Talib passes away, so that's an emotional replacement. Abu Talib passes away, now the Prophet ﷺ is beginning to see dreams of him moving to a place where there are palm trees. And he said, I don't know, at this stage, I don't know, whether it's Yamama, which is Riyadh, or Madin. Huh? Yes, sir. Yathrib, thank you. Yamama or Yathrib? A place that's got a lot of palm trees. Physical support has been replaced for the Messenger of Allah also. And now people have rejected him. And now the author, page 170 onwards, 
all the way to 174, he talks about how people are converting into Islam just by seeing and meeting the Messenger of Allah. Not only are people, individuals entering into Islam, but the jinn enter into Islam. Whilst the Prophet ﷺ is reciting in the night prayer, on his way back from Ta'if, the jinn are listening to him through the valleys. They've not heard him before, because he's not gone down that route. But now he's taken that route through the valleys of Ta'if, now he's coming back to Makkah through the valleys, the jinn are, recita- are listening to the recitation of the Qur'an. Surah Jinn is revealed, Surah Ahkaf is revealed, and there is another narration where when he comes back to Makkah, he goes back out and meets the jinn, and that's when he recites to them Surah Rahman, and he praises them for their response to when Allah says, Fabi ayata, Rabbikum Individuals are now coming in, Suwaid ibn Samit had some hikmah he believes that he inherited from Luqman, who Luqman was a wise man, so he came to the Messenger of Allah, he said, listen, let's level with each other, I am wise and you are wise. So the Prophet said, alright, then speak. So Suwaid so started speaking. The Prophet said, this is Hassan, this is very good, but I have something which is better. He started reciting the Quran, Suwaid so realized that this is a miracle. Uwais ibn Mu'adh, he came from the tribe of Aus, and he came to do some business with the Quraysh, and he happened to bump into the Messenger of Allah in Makkah. So the Prophet says, Uwais, oh, yes, what are you doing here? Sorry, Iyas his name was. Iyas ibn Mu'adh, what are you doing here? So the Prophet speaks to him, and he finds out that he's got some business with the Quraysh. He goes, listen, I'll make your journey here much more profitable. Believe in the oneness of Allah. And he gave him that one, and he ended up into Islam without praying one single salat, without knowing anything from the Qur'an. It's been narrated by others from the seerah that he went back to Medina, and all he had was dhikr, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Allah. And that was enough to make him enter into Jannah. Don't ever underlook the power of dhikr, especially in the two ends of the day. Abu Dharr Kifari, he comes and he's beaten by the Quraysh for... You know, looking for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he is ardent and he looks for him and he speaks to Ali and he, he's searching around Makkah for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They've cut him off now as well because he has no protection. He's living off Zamzam for a number of days, looking for the Messenger of Allah. And when, when he meets him, he enters into Islam. Tufayl ibn Amr is known as Dhunur. He comes from uh, Yemen. And he enters into Islam, but he says to the Messenger of Allah, I can't go back without a sign. I need a sign. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put an illumination on his forehead, between his eyes. And Tufail said, this is very good, but if I go back, they're going to be scared of me. It's like a light tube, or a tube light, coming from his face. They're going to, so he, the Prophet ﷺ took that nur and put it at the end of his whip. And he became known as the nur. When he went back, the whole tribe entered Islam. And later on, they all tried to make hijrah, and the Prophet ﷺ accepted them. And from this tribe, those came Abu Hurair, radiallahu anhu. Dumad al-Azdi came into Makkah, and he said, I feel sorry for this man, Muhammad. Everyone's saying he's a madman. Everyone say he's a poet. Everyone say he's possessed. Dubad al-Azdi was a raqi. He said, let me go and benefit Muhammad and do ruqya upon him. Once I've done the ruqya, this whole problem is gone. Compromise, boycott, all of this is gone. Let me just go do ruqya upon Muhammad. Dumad goes to perform ruqya upon the Messenger of Allah wasallam. The Prophet just says, not even wahi, not even the Qur'an, I mean... He gives him the khutbah tul haja. Dumad said, I have not seen anything which is more poetic that can fill up the oceans in its beauty than the khutbah tul haja. Not even recitation from the Quran, Dumad al So these people are entering into Islam. Like we said, Khadija gets replaced with Aisha, not long after her passing away, Abu Talib gets uh, replaced by Medina, not long, we know that now, but this is now the 10th year of Hijrah, there's not long left until he, the 10th year of prophethood, is not long until he makes the Hijrah. But his dua after Ta'if, Allah gives him something that he has never seen before in his life, and Ibn Taymiyyah and Al-Qaim, rahimahullah, said that this was the greatest night of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jibreel comes down, opens the ceiling and he takes the, the Prophet Sallallahu heart out and he washes it again and he tells him to ride Al-Buraq and from Buraq they go to Al-Aqsa and he hits Buraq before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sits down he said, Buraq calm down because there is nobody more noble that has ever ridden you that will ever ride you ever again behave yourself to Buraq Buraq takes him to Al-Aqsa and whilst he is travelling to Al-Aqsa the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sees from the dunya what he has not seen before he sees dunes, and inside the dune, mountains of the sand, he sees Musa alayhi salam standing and reciting and uh, praying to Allah. He sees three separate caravans, and one of those caravans, he actually stops and benefits those people of the caravan, brings back their camels, and he carries on. 
he sees Masjid Al-Aqsa and he leads the Anbiya in prayer. From then on, he left Burak there and he was elevated into the heavens. And every single heavens he went to, he was asked for permission. The, 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 angel, the, the angels, the doorkeepers had said, is he allowed to enter? Who is with you? And Jibreel is saying, I have Muhammad with me. And then they let him in. And every Jannah that he went through, he met a Nabi and he met a Rasul. And we talked about some of the significances and the blessings. But what he saw on that night in the dunya, he's never seen before. What he saw in the, in the unseen on that night, he's not seen before. He saw angels. He saw Jannah. He saw Jahannam. He saw people being punished. He saw the goodness that, he, that was there in Jannah also. He saw prophets. He saw a tree. And this is al this is a man, whenever he spoke, he was eloquent. This is a man, whenever he spoke, he was truthful. But he said one thing that he cannot do, which is one thing that he can't convey. The Sidratul Muntaha, he couldn't describe to us. He goes, I see these colors, I don't even know what they are. I can't even begin to explain them to you. He said, I've seen these things that are the insects and butterflies, looking things that are uh, surrounding them. And, and this tree is so awesome, one side to the other, it's 100 years of travel. Its root starts off in the sixth Jannah and it goes up to the Arsh of Rahman. And whenever a Wahi comes down from Allah, it changes the color. And nothing can go above that Sidr, that tree. And Jibreel says, This is where I stop. The Prophet was elevated further and he spoke to Allah. Allah decreed for him three things on that night the five daily prayers, the last ayat of Surah Al Baqarah. And there's another narration in the Sunan is that Allah has promised this Ummah that He will overlook, they will come under the Mashiach. And we talked about this in Masatiya. That it's specific for this Ummah. If you have people who meet Allah with Tawheed, but they've got major sins, they've got minor sins, Allah can pardon this Ummah on Yom Al-Qiyam. That's not being given to any other Ummah before. If people from the Ummah before, they've done something wrong, they will have to have that recompense Yom for this Ummah. Allah can choose to pardon, Allah can choose to punish. These are the three things that he got when he met Allah Jalla wa'ala. When he came down, he was isolated. And he was worried. It says he was hazin, which means he was sad, but he was worried. So Abu Jahal walks past the Messenger of Allah and he says, You look sad, you look worried, you look isolated. Have you got something new for me today? The Prophet said, Yes. I went to Aqsa last night and I came back. Abu Jahal said that this is enough. He said, if I bring the people, can you repeat what you just said to me now? I'm not going to even say anything. I'm just going to bring the people. I want you to say what you just said to me right now. Obviously, this is being very sarcastic. He brings the people and he tells them. Now people are whistling, people are jeering, people are insulting him. The believers now are shook, and we know they are shook because Abu Bakr becomes Siddiq on this day. And this is actually wisdom. Look at the benefit the Shaykh gives us. If Allah wanted, Allah could have taken the Prophet ﷺ from Makkah to Jannah, straight away. But Allah took him to Aqsa first, so that the Prophet ﷺ could see the things in the dunya that he's not seen before. So that his journey to the Akhirah can be reinforced and believed. So now, the Prophet ﷺ is sitting there, and he's talking about the caravans. That's one proof. And he said, it is as if I could see from the houses of Aqeel, from the houses of Aqeel, he's sitting in the direction of Aqeel, uh, one of the brothers of Ali, عن, as if Aqsa was lifted and suspended in the sky for me. And he described in great detail Aqsa. And the person that was quizzing him had been to Aqsa, and he said, by Allah, he has spoken the truth. He's even describing the crooks and the... Abu Bakr becomes Siddiq on that day. The next major event is the pledge, which is known as the first pledge of Aqaba. Whilst the Prophet ﷺ, uh, is during the days of Hajj, whilst the Hujjaj are coming, the Prophet ﷺ uses this as an opportunity to call to da'wah. There's a, a suq called Uqqaz that he used to walk through and he used to make tahleel la ilaha illallah wa la loudly, openly. And this is part of the talbiyah that we know today and this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to do in the days of Hajj. And this is a tradition that continues. This is part of the takbir that we do on the days of Eid. 
This is what the Prophet ﷺ was doing through the Sukh of Uqaz. Now the Sukh of Uqaz used to be a very big Sukh. Can you imagine the whole of the peninsula has come to perform Hajj and everybody has bought their riches from the north, south, east, west, from Yemen, from different places. So the Prophet ﷺ is walking through the Sukh. And now he manages to meet six men from the Yathrib. And he gives them da'wah and they accept. There's no further instructions. The Prophet said, goes back to Yathrib and just tell your people about Islam. The following year, during the days of Hajj, 12 men came back. Now the Prophet and this is known as the second pledge, or the actual first pledge if you want to look at it, because this is an actual pledge. Because now the Prophet says to them, there's more detail, but we can summarize it in saying, have tawheed, leave off shirk, stay away from certain major sins that he mentions. And I promise you that if you were to slip and make sins or f- fall, the doors of Tawbah will remain open for you. Well, do you agree to this? This is my da'wah towards you. This is the, 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 the deal that I want to have with you. Tawheed, leave off major sins. And if you slip up, if there is a mistake, if there is some kind of ignorance, Allah will leave the doors of Tawbah open to you. Would you agree to that? And he said, of course we agree to that. So the Prophet Wasallam said, go back to your people and give da'wah. And he sent with them one of the muhajirun, which was later known as muhajirun, one of the people of Makkah, Musab ibn Umair. Musab ibn Umair went to Medina, and he was like the Ja'far that went to Ethiopia. Hikmah after hikmah. People were hostile towards him. He was kind. He was calculated. He was generous. He, was, uh, he used wisdom. He taught using the Qur'an, and he was the very first person to establish shal- Salat al-Jum'ah, and he wasn't the Messenger of Allah, it was Musa bin Umayr in Madiyah. To the extent that when he started teaching the Qur'an, the Aws entered into, into Islam, the Khazr into Islam. And it's been narrated, even in this book it says, that the Qur'an was ringing around Medina. Hundreds and hundreds of households are reciting Qur'an. They've entered into Islam, what do they need to know? The first thing they need to know is Tawheed, they've entered into that. Now they need to start educating themselves. And each home is educating themselves with Qur'an, and each home is reciting with the dhikr of Allah. The following year, there's another pledge, and now this pledge is the pledge of support. 73 men with two women, they have a secret meeting on the last day of Hajj at Mina, and the Prophet ﷺ gives them the pledge, which is similar to that one uh, that we saw before, but also now that they will be with him until death. And they agreed. So now the Messenger of Allah begins the Hijrah. Now companions are leaving Medina, uh, Mecca and they are moving to Medina. The Quraysh get a whiff of this and now they know that something is happening. So they agree to have a summit. And I call it a summit because all of the tribes have come from all of the different regions. Including a very old man from Najd. And they need to talk about three very important things. Number one. If he goes to Yathrib, Aus and Khazraj, they're smaller than us, but they've been fighting for years. They will completely annihilate the Quraysh. They are stronger. Point number two, going up past Medina is our trade route. If Muhammad goes and settles himself in Medina, our trade route is gone. How are we going to get risk from Sham? Millions of pounds. And also, if people are going to leave Makkah, then our population is going to decrease and our economy is going to decrease. So now... This old man from Najd, he is the main person in that gathering and he is listening to different people and he's telling them, what do you think, what do you think? And he's refuting each one of them. Until Abu Jahl steps up and Abu Jahl says, what we need to do is every single one of our tribe members need to have one representative and every single one of us stab Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and kill him at the same time. Banu Hashim can't take on every single one of our tribes. And we can just hand out the blood money and we can contribute and it'll be very, very easy. It's over. Very intelligent plan. And Iblis said, that is the plan that you need to have. And when we were talking about this, and the Sheikh said, Iblis wants to elicit from you. He wants you to come up with an idea and then he will agree. He will beautify it. Because on your Muqiyama, he will say, I didn't tell you to do it. You told yourself to do it. I'm free from you. Anybody you'll make. The Prophet Wasallam is the last one left with Ali, with uh, the house of Abu Bakr, with Abu Bakr himself also. And Jibreel comes down to him and he informs him of the plot that happened at the Nadwa. Now the Prophet is fully aware that there is an assassination plan against him. So now he goes out to the house of Abu Bakr, midday. Abu Bakr knows that there is something very important because nobody comes out at this time. And Abu Bakr is told 
that the Messenger of Allah is going to make into. So Abu Bakr's first question is, Asuhbatan Ya Rasulullah, can I be with you, Ya Rasulullah? So the Prophet said, No. Yes. Aisha radiallahu anha said, He wept on that day like a child out of joy. I've never seen him cry so much. Abu Bakr now gets ready. And the amount of money he spends is roughly around 800 dirhams, which is roughly around 7,000 pounds to prepare for the hijrah of Rasulullah. He spends absolutely everything. Now, the people who are conspiring against him are monitoring and surrounding the house of the Messenger of Allah. Abu Jahl is standing at the door of the Messenger of Allah and he's clapping. And he's out of arrogance and out of joy and he's mocking the Messenger of Allah. He's talking about Persia, he's talking about Rome, he's talking about all these different places. We're going to kill him today. And he's mocking and he's very happy with the situation that he's seeing in front of him. They waited all day, surveillance in that house, until late at night, they thought, this is the time. He can't move, he can't run, and if he does run away, we'll be able to hear him. The Prophet ﷺ leaves his house in safety, reciting the Qur'an, and he goes to the house of Abu Bakr. They continue waiting, and as they are waiting, they realize that something is not right. So eventually, they storm the house, and they are asking for answers, and, and they are not given any answers. And they open the bed up and it's Ali there. Ali resembles the Messenger of Allah the most. So they start beating Ali up. He's still a young lad, 13, 14 years old. They're beating Ali up and Ali genuinely doesn't know anything. So now the Prophet ﷺ has gone out with Abu Bakr. Now, this plan is fault-proof. As in, it is so well thought. And the Shaykh mentions one after another. Number one, he left late at night. He didn't leave during the day. Number two, he used a substitute in his bed. Number three, he was reciting the Qur'an and he was making tawakkul in Allah and uh, making dua to Allah. Number f- four, he has a friend with him to support him. Number five, he didn't tell anyone, including Ali. He didn't tell Ali what was going on. And Ali gen- genuinely didn't know. Number six, he headed north first and then, sorry, he headed south and then north towards Medina. He used roads which were not conventional. He hired a guide, and the list goes on. One of the things that he also did is he told Asma, Asma, come out with the shepherd, bring us provisions, we're going to stay there for three days. Asma was the only one who knew, and other people. The shepherd goes out, uh, uh, Amir ibn Fuhayra, and he's able to cover up the tracks that Asma is leaving, to and fro, uh, to and fro from, from, uh, from Thaw. This clearly shows to us that tawakkul is not enough. And a person must have a very calculated plan. He must have the best possible means and then have tawakkul. The Prophet ﷺ stays at Thawr and Allah preserves him. The Quraysh send out uh, a bounty. A hundred camels on each one of their heads. A hundred camels is roughly around a hundred thousand each. So whilst the Prophet ﷺ is walking and he is very confident, and he is walking and he is not panicking, his companion is panicking. And he is looking left and right. And this is what Suraka Ibn Malik, the chief of the tribe of Mudlij, narrates. He says, I've seen two men. One man, he was very, very calm and he was reciting something. The other man, he is panicking and he's looking left and right. So I saw them from a great distance. So I went with them, went close to them with the horse. The story is a bit longer, but what happens is that the horse keeps collapsing and then he gets close to them and he recites. The Prophet is reciting. And he makes an agreement that he's not going to say anything. So then, Suraka. Uh, is given a promise to the messenger, by the Messenger of Allah. He says, Yes, Suraqa, how is it going to be when you are going to have the bracelets of Persia in each one of your hands? How will you feel on that day? And we talked about how that prophecy actually became true. Suraqa became a devout Muslim. There's also another incident that happened with Umm Ma'bad. She used to have a service station, if you call it that. People used to go there and they used to rest. But that year there was a drought. So the animals didn't have much milk. There wasn't much food that she could provide to the people that stopped there. So she went, so, so she welcomed them, the Prophet some stayed, and she made an excuse. She said, look, I know you're traveling and I'm supposed to be hospitable towards you, but we've had a drought. We've not got enough for ourselves, let alone to give you anything. So the Prophet Sallam says, give me a sheep, which is the lowest of your sheep. They've not had any child, no nothing. So she said, there's the sheep, but what are you going to do with it? If it's not had a child, how's it going to give you milk? The Prophet Sallam uh, wipes over it and the milk starts coming, pouring forth. And she know, now knows that this man, 
not only by his character and the way he was speaking and the way he looked and towards the end of Rahik al-Maktoum the author brings her description of the Prophet ﷺ before Hijrah and after Hijrah she knew that this was the Messenger of Allah and she knew that this was a miracle right in front of her eyes and what we learn from this now is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left her after benefiting her he didn't take from her he took what he needed but he actually left her with a greater benefit and for her husband and for her business and for the rest of her animals because if one animal is giving milk that's going to rejuvenate the rest of the herd and the rest of the stock and now she's made her business come back she's at a service station again so when Abu Ma'bad came back he was surprised he's gone out looking for risk and he's come back and the risk is there and he was amazed and when she described to him what she had seen, he issues out poetry. And now the ulama have differed. That poetry reaches Makkah. Is that a miracle that has been given through Abu Ma'bad? Or was it the jinn that carried it? Whatever the case, the people of Makkah heard the poetry of Abu Ma'bad. So the family of Abu Bakr now have realized that now the Prophet is close to Medina because that's where the service station was. So they are safe, alhamdulillah. The Prophet now arrives at Quba. The people are waiting and anticipating. As Zubair comes out and meets the Messenger of Allah, it gives him fresh new clothes, and the Prophet ﷺ meets other people. More than 60, 70 other people have entered into Islam. And what we can see from this is that the Messenger of Allah is making hijrah. And even when he is making a hijrah from Mecca to Al Madinah, he is restoring life physically for the people of Ma'bad and their, uh, and their um, service station, for Suraqa, for other people. He met a shepherd. And, he is restoring life and he is restoring Iman. People are coming out to him and he's talking to them and he's it's like a wind that is passing through the desert, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's reviving as he is moving along. So as he gets close to Medina, seventy other men have entered into Islam. Zubair comes out uh, after a caravan had come over and he comes out and he gives them some fresh new clothes. He is wearing white, Abu Bakr is wearing white, and they enter into Quba and they are they come out and it's a day of Eid they come out in their best clothes they come out with their armor and it's a whole celebration Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi stays with Banu Amr for four days they were looking after him then he moves on on the fifth day he performs Salatul Jumu'ah and then he enters into al Madina, and he commands the people of Medina to leave the camel alone because as he's entering into Medina people are happy People are singing. And they're saying, come with me, Ya Rasulullah. And they're trying to grab his camel and say, come to my house. Other people say, come to my house. Prophet said, everybody leave the camel alone. The camel has been commanded. Until it went to a, an open plot of land, deserted plot of land, which belonged to two orphans. Look at the rahmah of Allah. Two orphans are going to get their reward until Yom Qiyamah. This is where Masjid Nabu is. Like Surah Kahf. The Prophet could have gone to his house or his house and say, look, this is a built-up house already, we're just going to convert that into a masjid. No. Allah decreed that this camel is going to go to a, a plot of land to benefit two orphans until Yom Al-Qiyamah. The camel dropped its knees there and that's where the Prophet ﷺ commanded that that's where we're going to build Masjid al Nabawi. Society is now built, as the author is saying here, page 227. Uh, he's talking about the building of the masjid, which is iman and learning, but then he goes on to talk about brotherhood which we talked about is a social benefit, is a financial benefit. So now, as soon as he's gone into Medina, he's talking about Iman, he's talking about uh, worship, he's talking about learning, he's giving importance to those things which are part of your deen, but he's also giving part, and when the Shaykh was explaining these are hadith when he entered into Medina, he's talking about these hadith, some of them are well known, some of them are in um, uh, Imam al Nawi's 40 hadith He's talking about being good to the other Muslim and He's talking about not hating one another And be nice to one another And to be brothers to one another What the Prophet ﷺ is establishing Is social unity As well as financial unity And what this does now Is it sets down an infrastructure For people to live by They have Iman But they also have dunya also, and uh, I was going to omit this As part of the summary But I think this is very very important This is so important for us to all understand, and if there's one thing that you're going to take away, it's this. Very important. Why was the Prophet ﷺ now, after moving to Medina, commanded to show sternness and em- enmity towards the kuffar? Ya ayyuh nabi, jahid al-kuffar wal munafiqeen, waghluth alayhim. Make jihad against the kuffar and the munafiqeen, and be stern against them. The people of Tafsir have said, 
for 13 years as a prophet and for all of the years before that, for a good number of 53 years of his life, the Prophet ﷺ was soft in his nature. He was generous. He had etiquette. He was kind. He had character. He was nurturing. He was talking about how to make people feel happy and not sad. When the command comes about fighting, he can't have those characteristics. Allah is rebuking the Prophet Sallam and he's, uh, he's, he's telling the Prophet Sallam that you have to change slightly. It's not in your nature, but you have to do it for this particular reason. Because the kuffar and the munafiqeen need a person who is going to be stern against them. So he was not a madman, he was not a warlord, he was not a person who wanted to kill innocent people because Allah is telling the Messenger of Allah, for this one moment, when you go into war, when you're looking at justice, when you're talking about removing oppression, be stern. When you are out of that scenario, go back to being how you are. Be soft, be kind. Be rahmatul alameen. So from this what we learn is what is the intent of fighting. And Allah uh, talks about it, and this is what the author talks about in Surah Al-Hajj. أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينِ يُقَاتِلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا Fighting has been prescribed to the, for them because they have been oppressed for a number of years. And from what we learn from this, Allah is telling the Messenger of Allah to fight in both of these ayats, but the Prophet Sallam seeks to create dialogue. He's speaking with da'wah, he's starting off with da'wah, he's starting off with treaty. Violence is not the primary objective and it was not the goal of the Messenger of Allah Sallam. Either you have a treaty, or there is no treaty, or we're going to work on those things, or there is da'wah. Fighting, we don't, we're not really interested in. Also, whilst the Prophet ﷺ is very early on in the Madani period, the turning of the Qibla, which is also uh, very important as, for, for us Muslims as our Ummah, becomes our identity. And there are different patrols and expeditions which start, which then leads on to the Battle of Badr. And one of those expeditions that happens is that they've been sent out to spy for Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is travelling from Sham to Makkah, with more than six million pounds. When we looked at the actual book here and what he was carrying, he's got wealth to today's standard at that time in Arabia, six million pounds. If they hijack that, that is all of their wealth reimbursed. That is all of their property reimbursed. That is all of their blood money given back to them. This is what Allah is telling the Messenger of Allah in this ayah because they've been oppressed. That's why fighting and patrols and expeditions have been legislated for you, Ya Rasulullah. Abu Sufyan is coming back and he's heading towards Makkah. He knows now that the Muslims are coming to intercept. So he goes a different way. Whilst he's going a different way, he sends out a message to the Quraysh that Muhammad is coming with his people. So prepare an army. Abu Jahl prepares an army and they are heading towards Medina. And as they leave, they are being proud, they are drinking alcohol, they are doing all kinds of major sins as they are leaving. Whilst the believers are leaving, they are remembering Allah, they are making dua to Allah. It comes from the Qadr of Allah, and Allah talks about this in Surah uh, Al-Anfal, that if you had uh, a meeting point with them, it would have not happened. It wouldn't have happened. If you said, we're going to meet Abadr this time, this place, it wouldn't have happened. Allah made it. That Allah has decreed that this is going to happen and in this way. So the Prophet ﷺ sets up a tent at Badr and he spends all night worshipping and making dua to Allah. On the night of Badr, the night before, it rains and this sends down tranquility to the believers. And we talked about how in the time of worship, if you're feeling tranquil, in the time of uh, anxiety, tranquility overcomes you, know that this is from Allah. But in the time of worship, and the time of tests, you are not tranquil, know that this is from shaitan. Because that's what this rain symbolized. For the believers, Ali ibn Abi Talib said that we all slept the night before Badr. Nobody was anxious, nobody was scared. Every single one of us was tranquil. On the other side, it rained. How are you going to sleep in the desert when it's raining? They were nervous. The Prophet ﷺ, on the day of Badr commanded 
to set up their army in a particular way. We're going to look at that, but not to initiate fighting. The Prophet ﷺ continues supplicating to Allah in his tent until Abu Bakr hugs him from behind and he says, Enough, Ya Rasulullah, enough. You've been supplicating all night long. Allah will never forsake you. The Prophet ﷺ is saying, Oh Allah, if we, defeat, if we are defeated on this day, there is nobody that is remaining on the face of this earth that is saying, La ilaha illallah. Whilst he is making that supplication, whilst Abu Bakr is telling him to calm down, the Prophet ﷺ turns to Abu Bakr and he smiles and he said, Glad tidings, Ya Abu Bakr, there is your relief. The Quraysh now begin to charge towards the Muslim army. And the Prophet ﷺ instructed them, don't fight, and they didn't fight. In the, in the, in, at the back, we have the archers. At the, the front, or the middle line, we have the spears. And at the front, we have the swords. So the Prophet ﷺ is telling those people at the archers, you activate the archers when they come closer as a deterrent. If they come any closer, then the spears. If they come any closer, then the swords. Not that the Prophet ﷺ is saying, go and fight them, kill them, and that is it. If we can repel them with the arrows, and then they run away, khalas. That's what we, that is the objective. But they drew closer, and the Muslims threw their assault, and then they came closer, and some of those people that survived said that we saw things like Labbas. He said, I saw a man, I've never seen him before. And he was huge. And it wasn't this person or that person who defeated me, it was somebody else, I've never seen him again. The Prophet ﷺ also talked about Zubair al-Awam, and that the Malaika came down and the, the Kuffar on the other side saw the Malaika on, with the, the fashion of Zubair al-Awam. Even the way that he was wearing his clothes, they were wearing yellow turbans. And this is what they saw. They saw people coming down from the skies. Abu Jahl was still proud on that day, al Walid was still proud on that day. Umayyah was buried under stones. What he used to do to Bilal, what happened to him. Walid was killed also. And Abu Jahl was killed by two young men from the Ansar. And they were all thrown down the, the well at Badr. Walillah alhamd. Good news now goes to Mecca. Uh, good news now goes to Medina. Whilst Mecca becomes depressed. They are sad because they've got an actual loss. A lot of their heads and their beloved have passed away. But also, they have no government. And this is very important, because the next government that come in are not like the government that have gone. The Prophet ﷺ, when he goes back to Medina after Badr, there's also another incident that happens at Qaynuqa. Now the Jews who were living just slightly outside of Medina, they were not happy with Muhammad coming in and taking power. They had good relationships in Medina. Now he's kind of changing those things. They didn't like it. So what they did on one occasion is they basically uh, harassed a, a Muslim sister until her whole body was exposed. And Muslim who was there, he defended her and they ended up killing him also. So now the Prophet ﷺ realized that they had a treaty, that treaty has now been broken and Muslim blood or any kind of blood for that matter has been spilled. That has to be avenged. Either it's blood muddy, either it's qisas, whether it's a Muslim or not. Something has to be done. So the Prophet ﷺ goes out to Qaynuqa, and this is straight after Badr. 10 to 15 days after Badr. The Prophet ﷺ camps outside Qaynuqa. No fighting takes place because they were being proud and arrogant. They said, going to fight Muhammad, etc. They had actually even prepared an army and going to fight Medina. But when they were surrounded, they didn't do anything. The Prophet ﷺ allowed them to leave and exiled them to Sham. And he said, you can take whatever wealth you want, you can take whatever uh, possessions you want, you can take even the people you want. We've got prisoners. Now, by law at that time, you will keep them. They become your slaves. They become your property. The Prophet ﷺ said, take everything. Just leave. Qaynuqa, we're gone. There were other smaller incidents that happened. Abu Sufyan sought revenge, but then he ran away as well. There was an invasion of the Amar. Kaab ibn Ashraf, who was one of the heads of the Yahud, who used to spread anti-Islamic propaganda, come into Medina and harass women and harass the Messenger of Allah. He was killed. There was an invasion of Buhran. And Zayn ibn Haritha, whilst, the Prophet, whilst all this is going on, the Prophet is still sending out caravans to intercept Qurayshi wealth, because their wealth has not been given back to them, the Muslims. You know, their, their property, their blood money, all of these things that they left behind in Mecca, they've lost it. So the Prophet is still sending out caravans. Zayd intercepts one of them. This now leads to the Battle of Uhud. Quraysh, they were defeated at Badr. Now one of the caravans has been lost 
they want to seek military action once again. The Sheikh said, about the Battle of Uhud, there was not as many ayat that have been revealed about one particular incident except for Uhud. Almost the whole of Surah Al-Imran is talking about the Battle of Uhud. So now, the Quraysh are coming closer. So the Prophet ﷺ gathers the believers around and he says, listen, we've got one or two options. Either we defend Medina here, or we go out to Uhud. Uhud was considered as being outside of Medina at that time. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, I don't want to go. And this shows you his level. This is the way he's saying, Allah is saying, وَقْلُوا ذَلَيْهِمْ But if he can be, you know, not going out and fighting, he would do that. And this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to remain behind and see if they are going to come. If they come, then we can fight them. For me, it's likely that they'll run away just like they did last month. Abu Sufyan led 200 people and they ran away. The Prophet ﷺ is saying, no, let's, let's stay behind. The Ansar, a lot of the Ansar didn't witness Badr. And this is very important. Why didn't they witness Badr? Why, did, why were the Ansar missing at Badr? Because it wasn't planned. It wasn't a planned, it wasn't a battle. So if people were to say, well look, it was 300 against 1,000 and we should have tawakkal and we should go and fight all these countries that are attacking the Ummah, etc. That's not tawakkal. And look at what the Prophet ﷺ did when he had his hijrah. More than 15 steps of having a firm plan and then tawakkal. Badr was just coincidental. He went out to intercept that caravan, and then it turned into a war. So bat, uh, bat, the Battle of Badr was not a prescribed uh, engagement. So the Ansar, some of them missed out on this. So they've said, no, we, we were not there on that day. They are coming for us. We want to go out and meet them. Some of the Muhajirun, Hamza and others said, yes, we have to do this. Zubair, Umar. So the Prophet ﷺ agreed, so they went out to Uhud. The Fajr of that day, or the day before, Ibn Sulul has gone out, who was the head of the Munafiqun. He is, as they're going out, is talking against the Messenger of Allah. He is not doing the right thing, and we should go back, and we're going to get destroyed, etc. And some of the believers, and these are some of the people who entered into Islam from the very beginning, were taken aback by this fitna, to the extent that a thousand people left to go Uhud, 300, a third of the army went back because of the da'wah of Ibn Sulul. Now what this teaches us is that, when people start leaving the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, it becomes very easy for us not to submit. It becomes very easy for us not to be united, 300, 700. And it becomes very easy for us to start spreading and accepting rumors, even if it's against the Messenger of Allah, even if it's against our aqidah, even if it is something which is in the Qur'an, they will start saying, well, chopping the hand is barbaric, and there are no women's rights, and we need to change some of these things, and... The Muslim st- strategy was like this. And you can see the white lines here, that's the Muslimun, and the red lines there are the Quraysh. Now the Quraysh are expecting the Muslims to come from here. The Muslims took an, uh, an alternative route and they came from here. Now this is very important, why? Because now they are stuck in this valley. Another thing happens now is that all of the main men for the Quraysh are here, and all of the weaker men are here. If the Muslims are coming from here... They're going to fight the weaker men first. The Muslims have archers. They've got aerial threat over the enemy. They don't have that. What this does now is that they can't flee. Because if they flee, they're going to flee towards Medina. They know that there's at least 300 people in Medina. So they can't go towards Medina. The only way is that they can go either back to Mecca. Or that they are going to be defeated. So it's a very strong plan for the believers. The Prophet ﷺ says to the archers, Do not move. 50 of you, you're going to stay on the arches. From 700, it's only 50. Stay at the top of the mountain. Even if you see us winning, even if you see us losing, whatever the case, do not move. As the battle begins, the Muslims are wiping them out. 3,000 against 1,000, the believers are overcoming them with ease. Until the mushriks had been defeated, and it looked like that, the archers came down and they saw the booty in front of them. They saw all of the wealth that they left behind. So the archers came down. Khan ibn Walid sees this as a narration that Iblis was on top of one of the mountains and he called out to Khalid. Khalid came from the other side of that mountain there and attacked the believers on the back. Now the Muslims, they are in the red lines. They have captured the archers. So they've got the archers. Or the, they've captured the mount. So they've got the archers. They are in... The, the valley and their strong men are at the, at the back and the weak men are at the front. This mistake has led to 
a lot of Muslims dying. To the extent that the Prophet ﷺ was left with only nine people around him, and the only thing he could do was flee into the mountains. Not flee to Medina, he didn't flee from the battlefield, but he fled to a different tactical position. So now, the Prophet ﷺ is surrounded by roughly around nine from the, the Ansar, and they are being killed one at a time with ease. To the extent that the Prophet ﷺ is now hiding, and he has only Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and Talha ibn Ubaidullah to defend him. The Prophet ﷺ, his tooth is broken. The Prophet ﷺ, his bottom lip has been hurt. His armor from his helmet has cut in to his cheek, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And what we can learn from this is that when a, a group of people leave the sunnah, when a group of people start being happy with their sins, the ummah will become weak. The ummah will become depressed. The ummah will become overcome, and the enemy power will dictate over us. This battle continues until Ibn Qami'ah, one of the people who hit the Prophet ﷺ, kills Musab ibn Umair. Musab ibn Umair was a very handsome man. Ibn Qami'ah, remember this is a new generation, the old government are being killed at Badr. This is a new generation that have come out. He doesn't know what the Prophet ﷺ looked like. So he says, the Messenger of Allah is dead. This man, look how handsome he is, I've killed him. So now everybody is spreading rumors that the Messenger of Allah has passed away. Now depression and confusion spreads around the believers. The Messenger of Allah is dead, what do we do? Alhamdulillah, Ka'b ibn Malik sees the Messenger of Allah and he makes the call that the Messenger of Allah is alive, Alhamdulillah. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, has several attempts to turn away and to make an escape route. Finally he makes an escape route. Now the women have heard that the Messenger of Allah is in trouble. And they are coming, Aisha is coming, and the auntie of the messenger are coming, and all these people are coming, and they are helping out the believers. The Quraysh make a final shout to the, the, the believers. Abu Sufyan calls out, Muhammad, are you alive? And the Prophet ﷺ tells Umar to reply to him. And there's a small dialogue which basically concludes as in saying that the Messenger of Allah is confirmed alive. And Tawheed continues, Islam continues. And Abu Sufyan says, next year, fourth year of Hijrah at Badr again. After the Battle of Uhud, there were a few different expeditions. One of those expeditions led to a Muslim killing a mushrik by accident. So the Prophet ﷺ needed help in paying the blood money. He goes to Banu Nadir. And he says to Banu Nadir, who were Jews, they were very wealthy. Banu Nadir, can you help us pay the blood money? So they said, go sit next to this wall and we'll get the money for you. Whilst they went away, they plotted to kill the Messenger of Allah. Allah's Messenger, Allah's Angel Jibreel comes down and tells the Messenger of Allah to move. That they are plotting an assassination by throwing a rock over your head. The Prophet ﷺ stands up and he walks straight to Medina. The companions that were there with him at Nadir, they didn't know what was going on when the Prophet ﷺ, on his way back to Medina, tells them that they were proving to be treacherous. The Prophet ﷺ prepares his army and there is a siege for about one to two weeks outside Nadir. Same thing happened with Qaynuqa, happens now with Nadir. The Prophet ﷺ tells him, take whatever you want, take whatever prisoners you want, go and exile from this area. Fast forward now to the fifth year of Hijrah. Again, like I said, we're going to try and take the main, uh, you know, the main points. I know we're going to say we're going to finish at 45. It's 39 already. Uh, if, if you want to leave, you feel to leave. Uh, but we'll carry on with the Allah until we finish. Uh, the Battle of Ahzab happens now in the fifth year of Hijrah. Now, this is one of the greatest tests. The reason why is because this, we can even call it a world war. The reason why is because the whole of the peninsula have gathered around al Madina, All of the tribes. And this is the greatest enemy that surrounded Medina and the Messenger of Allah They didn't know what to do. Sulman al-Farsi came up with a plan. Now, the believers, Medina, is protected from two sides. Banu Quraidha has a treaty with the believers. So if they want to attack from that side, they won't be able to because they've got a treaty. The only way they can attack is from the north. And they know that. The Quraysh are going to come from the north. And this is where they came from last time, Uhud. And this is where... All of the other tribes can gather from also. So from the north is the way that they're going to come. 
So Salman said, radiallahu an, let's build a trench. And that trench is more than 20 arm spans apart. They will not be able to get across that. The animals won't be able to get across. And if a man tries to get across, by the time he gets up from the other side, he's going to be too tired. We can overcome him. Excellent plan. And it worked. And it worked for a large number of days. You know, they were on siege. But it was obviously a time where the Muslims were going through starvation. There were rations and there were different miracles given to the Prophet ﷺ to aid him. But there is a problem now. The Jews at Quraidha said, we can attack from Medina from the south. And if we can do that, all of these 10,000 mushriks will be at our service. Imagine how much money we can make. Imagine how much money. So then, Huyay ibn Akhtab speaks to the leader of Banu Quraidha and he says to him, let's go and attack. He said, no, 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 we can't do that. We've got a treaty. And he tried to dismiss it, but then eventually they agreed. So they prepared an army. The believers are now sandwiched. They've got the mushriks from the north. They've got the Jews coming from the south. What do they do? The Prophet ﷺ was very optimistic. Even though Allah describes the believers in having their, th- their hearts come towards their throat, it was a very a difficult situation. They were genuinely very, very scared, the believers. The Prophet ﷺ was very optimistic. He said, actually, this is their downfall. And he spoke the truth. Prophecy came true. A man from this side came from the trench and he came over to Medina and his name was Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud al-Ashja'i and he said to the Prophet ﷺ, I want to enter into Islam, completely unprovoked. And the Prophet ﷺ says to him, okay, but we need you. Nu'aym, what he did is he went round to the Jews, he went round to the different tribes and he started talking about the negative traits of all these other people. The Jews, do you really trust them? Quraysh, do you really trust them? The Ghattafan, do you really trust them? All of these people are treacherous and you know them. The Jews are treacherous. The Mushriks are treacherous. And what happened is the plan worked. Now, there was confusion. Now, there was distrust amongst the Ahzab. And now, Allah, from the Prophet ﷺ's dua, a strong wind came. And that wind was carrying rain. That wind was carrying very cold temperatures. And we looked at an example of a sandstorm which you know, was very overwhelming over the whole city, it completely drove away all of the people. More than 10,000 people were driven away. Banu Quraidha, even though they had an army and they were heading towards Medina, they stopped. And then we went back. So after the Prophet ﷺ finishes with Ahzab, he comes home, and he now has to deal with Quraidha. He knows that there is a problem with these people. So the Prophet ﷺ goes there and there is a siege outside Quraidha. And Quraidha are in a very bad situation because they can't continue the siege because they themselves don't have enough rations. They are very tired. The temperature is very cold. So Quraidha eventually surrenders. And Allah sends, Allah's Messenger sends for Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh to come from inside of Medina, to come outside. So it's completely neutral, impartial. He wasn't there at Quraidha. The Prophet ﷺ tells him, this is what's happened, now you decide. And the Prophet ﷺ walked away. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad said that these people need to die. All of them need to be killed. And the Prophet ﷺ praised him. He said that this is the decree from, with, with Allah from above his arsh, Jalla wa'ala. It's the exact same thing that Allah himself has decreed. Now, a person might look at that and think, well, look, Islam is a violent religion. How can he go and kill more than you know, thousands of men uh, instead of imprisoning them, put them in jail or something. Why do you want to kill them? This was a fair decision. The reason why is because they over and over again broke treaties. And if they were allowed to live, they would have carried that on. Another problem with these people is that they possessed more than 1,500 swords, 2,000 spears, 300 coats of armor, and 500. And the reason why that is bad is because that is what we would consider as nuclear weapons as today. That is a lot of weapons. If we let them live, if we put them into exile like we did with the Qaynuqa and Nadir, they will use that and they're going to attack Medina, guaranteed. The only way is to stop these people. And at that time, the only way was to annihilate people. Now, this is a very important point. And I think I'm going to make this point afterwards, which is that there are some prescribed laws and rules. Cut the hand of the thief, you know, behead the apostate, 
kill people in this manner if they are treacherous. But the Prophet ﷺ didn't enforce that upon us. The ruler must be wise when he is trying to create justice within his own country. So now if there's blasphemy laws in one country and that's going to create a worldwide you know, a human rights campaign against that country and then they're going to blame Islam because of that, then it's that country is at fault. It's not, the, it's not Islam. Because the Prophet ﷺ has given us utensils and he's given us tools to use our aqal. And he says, listen, if killing people is going to create more harm, then don't do it. If killing people in this scenario is going to have a greater good, then do it. But he himself didn't want to do that, but there is a greater good. So the point that I'm trying to make here, especially in the day that we're living in today, cutting the hand of the thief, all of those things, all of that is leeway. And the Sharia gives us that. And we will see more examples of this as uh, the seer goes on. In the fifth year and the sixth year, there were different expeditions that happened. Uh, and what we learn from all of this also is that the believers don't believe in... Divide. Islam doesn't believe in divide and conquer. The kuffar will come into a Muslim country and they will try and make one group of people, one culture, attack another culture, even though they are brothers and they have iman. Islam didn't do that. Islam sent out patrols, they sent out delegations, they sent out expeditions in order to create unity. You can keep your culture, you can keep your language, you can keep everything that you want. You can even keep your religion. In certain instances he said, listen, you can keep your religion, you can remain Christian, Let's have a treaty, or you give us the jizya, or something like that. Islam doesn't believe in divine. And that is very important because that then refutes the idea that Islam was spread by the sword, or the objective was to spread Islam by the sword. Yes, Islam did spread by the sword to some degree, but to some degree it didn't. It's because Islam doesn't believe in divine conquer. The sixth year of Hijrah, there was the Basil Muraisi, which is towards Mecca, and this is not really... Uh, uh, a very important battle for the sake of the battle itself It is after the battle The Prophet ﷺ has the munafiqoon Who become more vocal The most vocal you could say probably up to this stage They create a story that his wife Aisha has had an affair against the Messenger of Allah Can you imagine that? The Messenger of Allah he is married to a siddiqa and she is now known as Siddiqa because of these ayat that come out after Al-Ifq. But she is a Siddiqa and she is the daughter of a Siddiq. They said that she had an affair with another person. The wife of the Messenger of Allah had an affair with a different person. After the Battle of Ahzab, the Prophet ﷺ married the wife of his son. Islam said that no, that wasn't his son. Sayyid bin Haritha. So now the munafiqoon are using that and said, look, he's marrying, this is incest, this is just terrible. Another plot. The ifq was a plot. So now, after the muraisi, they are becoming very, very vocal. And this created a lot of problems for the Messenger of Allah. And it's harmed the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it was a huge test for him. The reason why is because revelation stopped for one whole month because of this problem. The hypocrites were increasing and spreading their rumors and rejoicing to the extent that some of the companions themselves got involved and they became confused. Aisha radiallahu anha said that I've never felt a sadness up until this point and never suffered in this manner. Abu Bakr radiallahu an, uh, you know, wasn't visiting the messengers sallam, in the same manner. He didn't know what to say. She would say, to her father Abu Bakr Can you go and give him a reply for me and for my behalf Abu Bakr used to excuse himself Abu Bakr for the first time in his life Couldn't speak to the messenger of Allah This is the one who was with him in Thaw Until 10 ayats came down To make her a Siddiqah Now here's another proof of the thing I was just saying a moment ago Did the Prophet ﷺ punish the hypocrites? No he didn't And a lot of the ulama have said the reason why Is because The Prophet ﷺ didn't see it having a greater good This person has gone against the ayat of Allah, they have mocked the Messenger of Allah, surely he should be killed, but the Prophet ﷺ didn't see. So now, how is that with the Prophet ﷺ in his time? How should we be today, when the Ummah is in a state of weakness? I'm not trying to say, let's get rid of the Sharia and our punishment schemes, and I'm not talking about, let's change our religion, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that our governments, our homes, our communities, our societies, our cultures, our, our, the ummah as a whole need to be more diplomatic and they, used to be, they need to be more learned and they need to employ more wisdom.
There's no doubt about that. When you're speaking to the kuffar, when you're walking down the street, when you're talking about politics, when you're talking about incidents like this. Now, on page 394, the Prophet ﷺ tells Abu, uh, Umar something which is absolutely amazing. He says to him, Umar was saying all this time, whilst uh, Ibn Salul is spreading rumors that Aisha has had an affair, Umar was saying throughout this whole time, why don't you just go kill this guy? You know that he's saying, why don't you just go kill this guy? Now some of the ulama have said that it wasn't, he wasn't as abrupt, he was being, you know, uh, he was being devious, etc. Now there's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Ibn Hisham where the Prophet ﷺ says to Umar now, after the ayat have come down, the relief has come. The Prophet ﷺ says to him, don't you see now, Umar, if I had killed him before, people would have said that Muhammad is killing his own people. And, and if people w- were sympathizing with Ibn Salul, they would have sympathized with him even more. Once now they know that Ibn Salul is a liar, and these were all part of his propaganda, and all of it was just based on lies, people will willfully reject him. You see the hikmah. So Umar radiallahu anh said in response, By Allah, the, the Prophet's judgment is far better than mine. After the battle of Muraysi, there was a few other expeditions, but one of them, which is very interesting, and again, reinforcing what I've just said a moment ago, a group of people called, from Urayna, they came into Medina and they said, we want to become Muslim. They entered into Islam, but they couldn't live in Medina, they felt sick. So the Prophet ﷺ said, leave Medina, because you can't handle the climate in Medina. Leave Medina. But on your way out, I have some shepherds outside that belongs to Bayt al-Mal. You can benefit from the camels that are there, the milk and the urine, etc. As they were leaving, they killed the shepherd, they took the camels, and they apostated. And these were then known as the ayat of huruq. These are known as the ayat of kidnapping or apostasy. The Prophet ﷺ uh, punished them. But within the context of these ayat, Allah says that if they make tawbah before you reach them, then Allah is before Rahim. So what we learn from this is that violence and capital punishment all have a context. You can't say I'm going to cut a person's head off or his, his hand off or I'm going to be violent towards another person if they disagree with me. That's point number one. But what we learn from this is that the ruler can decide whether they want to implement the punishment or not or how they want to implement the punishment or not. So a person now, he apostates from the religion. We have an Islamic ruler. Does he chop his head off or does he put him on death row? Which would seem more, you know, synchronized with the world that we're living in today. I'm not trying to say that we are uh, manipulate the Sharia. I'm, I'm just trying to say, well, when the Muslims are in a state of weakness, we need to use hikmah. The sixth year of Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ sees some dreams. And in those dreams, he is making Umrah, and he is shaving his head. And he sees those dreams over again, and he knows that this is from Allah. And Surah Al-Fatih is being revealed in describing uh, the Hudaybiyah. The Prophet ﷺ gives that news to his companions and they are all ecstatic and they all put their ihram on and they leave for Mecca. As they get to Mecca, the Quraysh stop them. One by one, another diplomat is sent, another person is sent, the Prophet ﷺ is speaking to each and every one of them, and they are trying to make the Prophet ﷺ either compromise or leave, and the Prophet ﷺ said, we're not going to compromise, we're not going to leave. And every single one of them are failing. The Prophet ﷺ then decides, okay, well, they keep sending people to us, let's send a person into Makkah. Who can we send? The Prophet ﷺ says, Umar. Umar says, no, 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 I'm the wrong person, I'm too harsh, I've left on bad terms, and I'm not as strong strongly related to the people of Quraysh, like Uthman. Uthman is gentle, Uthman is clever, Uthman is rich, he comes from a very affluent family, send Uthman in. Uthman goes in, he speaks to Abu Sufyan, and he's speaking to Abu Sufyan for so long, giving him da'wah, and he's speaking to him so nicely, Abu Sufyan, after hours and hours says, listen Uthman, you can go do Umrah, as much as you want, and then leave, you're under my protection. Uthman says, I can't do that. Rasul of Allah is outside and you're making me do Umrah alone. Either we do it together or nothing. Whilst Uthman is speaking to Abu Sufyan, he's using hikmah, he's speaking to him nicely, they're speaking frankly and you know, they're, they're behaving themselves with each other. And you know, it's, a, it's a nice, pleasant uh, interaction that they've had. The people outside of Mecca have thought that Uthman has been killed. So then the Prophet ﷺ, without any weapons, takes a pledge with them. 
that we are going now to avenge the death of Uthman and death until death, basically. We've got no weapons, but we have to, we can't leave Uthman. They took the pledge, but at that moment, Uthman comes back. And he then finds out that they've taken a pledge, then he takes a pledge himself also. The Quraysh send out Suhail ibn Amr, and then the Prophet ﷺ becomes happy, because Suhail means Sahl. Sahl means something which is easy. The Prophet ﷺ was optimistic, and he says, Suhail, he's a, he's, a, he's a sensible person. He is coming, the Quraysh have sent this sensible person now, maybe we can agree some kind of a treaty, and they did. And they agreed to four main things. Number one, the Muslims can't perform Umrah this year, they have to come back next year. Number two, there is no war between us and you for three years, for ten years. Part of that is our friends will not fight against your friends, and your friends will not fight against our friends. We, if anyone leaves Makkah to go Medina, they must be returned. This is the, the summary of it all. Now, this has been classed as a fat from Allah. That this was an apparent victory. Not the Fatah of Makkah itself, this was the day when Allah helped the religion and it became uh, apparent in the peninsula. Because now the author says, war is abolished. What this means is now the Prophet ﷺ for a period of two years is able to spread da'wah and speak to people. No violence. He can just go and speak to people. Dialogue, treaties, be nice to people, show them the beauty of Islam. He sends out 14 different letters to different locations. Some of them enter into Islam, some of them enter into treaties, some of them end up rejecting. And what we've learned from those letters that the Prophet ﷺ sends, and all of them have been documented here in the book, which is that the Prophet ﷺ used a great deal of hikmah, and he went straight to the point. So if you are speaking to someone, hikmah and getting to the point is very important. The seventh year... Of Hijrah. And this is one of those battles that the Prophet ﷺ had, which was an aggressive and oppressive battle type of jihad. It wasn't defensive. He himself went out to Khaybar. And the reason why is because Khaybar was a huge financial uh, powerhouse. They had a lot of economy, they had a lot of military strength, and that was the, that was the only strength that remained in the peninsula. So they went out there and they, they lay out there for siege for a number of days. There was a bit of fighting that was going on until the Prophet ﷺ had a Jew that came out and he taught the Prophet ﷺ that this is their water channel that's going into their fortress. If you cut that off, cut off, they'll all come out. That's what he did. The Muslims ransacked Khaybar, some of them said, now there's a dispute here, did they overcome or did they surrender? And we talked about this in the Dars. What seems to be apparent is that they surrendered. And because they surrendered, they handed voluntarily their wealth over to the Messenger of Allah. But they said, Ya Rasulullah, please let us live, let us continue. There was more than 40,000 palm trees. You don't want to destroy that, you don't want to put us in exile. We can continue that for you. And the Prophet ﷺ agreed that this now became Muslim land, you can carry on working, we take 50 and you take 50. Ibn Umar said, after the day of Khaybar, that was the first time I ate to my fill. All of this time, I never knew what it felt like to eat to my full. Aisha, look at the simplicity of Aisha radiallahu anha. Instead of saying, we can choose whatever dish we want. Dates was very, you know, basic kind of food at that time, and it still is now. She said, I can choose whatever date I wanted. Not whatever dish I wanted. Whatever date, well, at least we've got now a variety of dates, Aisha radiallahu anha. Also, this was joyous because Muslims came back from Ethiopia, and the Prophet Sallam now marries Ramla, and after the battle of Khaybar, he marries Safiya, and all of this has a great deal of hikmah. In the seventh year of Hijrah also, there was that of Diqa, and in this battle, there were a few incidents, but most of which were the mushriks, they ran away, and this is when the fear period was described, uh, prescribed, should I say. The following year now, he performs the Umrah, which was the compensatory Umrah, which was agreed with the Quraysh, and whilst he is there, Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Messenger of Allah, so Sallam says, here's Maymuna, she wants to marry you. She was the only woman who proposed herself to the Messenger of Allah, and he accepted. After that Umrah, he returned, there were a few expeditions that happened. One of them uh, led to the Battle of Mu'ta. Now the Battle of Mu'ta, the Prophet Sallam is continually sending out da'wah. He sends out Al-Harith ibn Umayr al-Azdi to a village in Sham. Now the village in Sham is not Roman. They've got Roman ties, but they're not Roman. He wants to invite that village to Islam. Al-Harith al-Azdi is going to that village, but he gets intercepted 
by the Romans. And then he is killed. So the Prophet ﷺ sends out 3,000 people because he thinks it's the, that village has killed him, not the Romans. 3,000 people, more than enough for that village. Send them out. Whilst the Prophet ﷺ is sending them out, he puts Zayd ibn Haritha in charge. And he says, if you pass away, then Ja'far. If you pass away, then Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And he sends them out. And he says, this is Sahih Muslim. Fight in the name of Allah and for the sake of Allah. Those who disbelieve in Allah, do not be treacherous. Do not ambush them. Do not kill any women or children. Do not kill the elderly. Do not kill a worshipper. Do not destroy their plantations. Do not uh, destroy any trees. And do not destroy their buildings. These were the, the, the instructions that were given to the Prophet ﷺ, or he gave to them in this uh, offensive kind of jihad. Now, as we were talking about in the Dasan, I think it's a very important point here. He said, do not kill a worshipper and do not kill their monks in another narration. Had it been that Islam wants to kill kufr, then they should be the very top of those people who should be killed. There would be no concession. So Islam doesn't want to have a fight against kufr. Islam wants to convert kufr so that they become Muslim themselves. Islam has jihad prescribed so that it can remove oppression. The Romans now think that the army is coming for them. They prepare 2,000 men. 2,000 men against 3,000 Muslims. The Muslims are fighting. Zayd and Haritha fought uh, fiercely. He got killed. Radiallahu anhu. Muhibbir Rasul, the Prophet Sallam, received wahi and he started weeping. That was his son. Fostered son. Ja'far, radiallahu anhu, held the banner with his right hand, got cut off. Held the banner with his left hand, got cut off. Held the banner between his neck and his chest, head got cut off. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I can see Ja'far has his arms replaced with wings and he can fly wherever he wants in Jannah. Janahin. Abdullah ibn Ruwaha, he continued fighting. He became the next Amir as the instructions were of the Prophet ﷺ. And as he is fighting, he is talking about to his soul about the benefits of the Akhirah. Whilst in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ is informing them what is happening and he is weeping. And then he looks up and he says, A safe from the Suyuf of Allah has picked up the banner. Who is he talking about? Khalid bin Walid. Khalid bin Walid becomes the Amir. This is not being given as instruction by the Prophet ﷺ. It was their own ishtihad. Khalid bin Walid says, listen, I've got a plan. We're losing this battle. Only 12 have died. 200,000 against 3,000. Only 12 have died. It's not huge. But how are we going to win this? I mean, it's, it's not conceivable. Khalid said, I've got a plan. Number one, every time we go and fight, you fight for a prescribed period of time. We've got four parts of the army, east and west, or right and left, north and south, or front and back. What we're going to do is we're going to systematically swap. What that does is it changes the faces of the army, who they are fighting against the Muslims. So now the Romans are thinking, well, I was fighting this guy in the morning, now I've got new faces I'm fighting in the afternoon, I've got new faces I'm fighting after Asr. These guys have got a large number. What it also does is that whilst the flanks are moving, the animals are moving, the sand is going up in the air. What that seems is it gives the illusion that there's people coming from the back. And Khalid bin Walid said, remain united. What happened was the Romans became fearful. The Romans, the plan worked. They said, we're fighting new people all the time. There's dust in the back. We need to go back. And they went back. And that had a huge impact on the peninsula because it created a good reputation for the believers and now they were using tactics that have never been seen before. And because it's from Bani Adam's nature that the weak will follow the strong, people were entering into Islam voluntarily. Treaties and people entering into Islam. The Prophet ﷺ enters into Mecca on the eighth year. And this happens because one of the Quraysh allies attacks one of the Muslims' allies. The Prophet ﷺ gives them three solutions. Either you pay blood money, either the Quraysh, he says to the Quraysh, either you pay blood money for the people that have been attacked, or you free yourself from Banu Bakr, because they are the ones who are attacked, so let us go deal with Banu Bakr, or end the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and let's go back to war. There was no firm response, so the Prophet ﷺ prepared an army, and they headed towards Makkah. And the Prophet ﷺ instructed the believers, do not fight anyone. Al Abbas comes out to meet the Messenger of Allah, so and he enters into Islam. He sees Abu Sufyan, and Abu Sufyan goes to the Messenger of Allah, and he sees the generosity of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu He enters into Islam. So now there is this whole procession that is entering into Mecca peacefully. And the Prophet ﷺ is giving different tribes their different banners. 
So that the people of Mecca can see different colors, they can see different cultures, they can see different languages. The Prophet ﷺ enters into Mecca and he performs the tawaf and he removes all the idols surrounding the Kaaba. He enters into the Kaaba and he purifies the Kaaba itself also. The people in the following days end up giving bay'ah to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. He settles in Mecca for a number of days and he dispatches different expeditions. Those expeditions now are going out to de- call people to Tawheed, securing treaties around the Mecca, and also destroying the idols inside of Makkah and outside of Makkah. And from the hikmah that there was no fighting happening on the day of Fatih, the weapons and the strength and the energy is still there with the believers. The Prophet ﷺ heads to Hunayn. And he fights the people of the Mushriks. This is the last Mushrik tribe, and there's about 30,000 of them now. It's a large number that remain. Upon. This is the last sign of shirk in the peninsula. The Prophet ﷺ takes them out to Hunayn. He de- they are defeated. Because their pride got the better of them, the believers on that day, when the Prophet ﷺ supplicated, the angels came down, uh, the, the companions narrated that a thick black cloud filled the valley, and the mushrikun ran away. They ran to Ta'if. The Prophet ﷺ lay at siege at Ta'if, and eventually they came down and they surrendered. They, were, they didn't enter into Islam, but they just surrendered. The Prophet ﷺ after Ta'if, he gave out the spoils of Hunayn and Ta'if, and he just kept on giving to the, the people who have just entered into Islam. Safwan, some of them have said, he wasn't Muslim yet. Safwan was the, one of the biggest enemies of the Messenger of Allah. He said, I hated him so much. I was looking at that day, and I hated him. But he kept calling me, and he gave me sheep. And I still hated him, but he gave me sheep. He called me again, and he gave me more sheep. So now my level of hate kind of went down a bit, but I still hated him. He called me again, he gave me more sheep. He gave me hundreds and hundreds of sheep until I only felt love for him. And this is what he was doing on that day. The Prophet ﷺ was patient with those people who had bad manners. This was the day when that Dhu Khuwaisara came and he said, Muhammad, you are not being just. Be just. And from him came the progeny of uh, the Khawarij. From there he went to perform Umrah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And after the Fatih of Mecca, there was another battle, which is the last battle of the Prophet ﷺ, which is the battle of Tabuk. Rasulullah prepared a huge army, sent out to the Romans. The Romans learned that there's 30,000, not 3,000. They got scared. They ran back. The Prophet now is finished with battles. So now we are looking at the ninth year of Hijrah, and he is bringing in delegations from different parts of the peninsula, and they are all entering into Islam. The farewell Hajj of the Prophet is in the tenth year of Hijrah, and sorry, the ninth year of Hijrah. And the Prophet ﷺ then, in the 10th year, is taken uh, to his Lord. In the last two weeks, the Prophet ﷺ, his health becomes very bad. He's suffering from fever. He has a headache. And he asks to stay in the house of Aisha. Radiallahu anha. Four days before he passes away, he was functioning. He was leading the prayers. But before four days before, he couldn't move. He could still talk, but he couldn't move. So he appointed Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr became the Imam of Masjid al-Nabawi. The first Imam. After the Prophet ﷺ, and he led 17 prayers while the Prophet ﷺ was still alive. One day before he passed away, he cleared out his house, he gave away all of his possession, and on the day he died, he looked at the believers on Salat al Fajr, he lifted the curtain, and he smiled at the Ummah because of the Salat that they were establishing. Family members started to visit the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, and he was saying goodbye to them. And on that day, after Salat al-Fajr, he didn't live to see Salat al-Dhuhr, sallallahu alayhi wa He was laying on his bed. He was asking Allah to help him through the, the pain of death. And he was saying, La ilaha illallah, inna lil mawti sakarat And he, eventually his situation became worse and worse until he couldn't even speak. His voice went really low. And all he was saying then was, Ila al-Rafiq al-A'la to the highest companion, to the extent then Aisha saw him become so weak, she grabbed him and she held him to her chest and she was holding him close and as his voice got weaker and weaker, her ear became closer to the mouth of the Messenger of Allah until she said, I heard him saying something but there was nothing coming out but I can see his mouth moving saying, Ila Rafiq ala. He chose to be with Allah Jalla wa ala. He had the choice, Allah gave him the choice of staying in the dunya and having the entire dunya and everything that is within it, or what is with Allah, and he chose Rafiq al-A'la. And the twelfth year, so the twelfth of Rabi al-Awwal in the tenth year, 
the Prophet ﷺ, of Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ passed away. He was 63 years old, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. On Tuesday they washed him, and on Wednesday they buried him. This is uh, the seerah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We ask Allah's pardon for going over it for so uh, thoroughly and so 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 quickly and not thoroughly. Uh, and I ask Allah to make this beneficial for us all, and that we learn from its benefits, and that this is not the last time that we read and benefit from the seerah, and that Allah is pleased with us, and that He makes us with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the dunya and the akhirah. Hada wallahu alaihi wasallam, Muhammad wa alihi wasahbihi.